I'm sort of fascinated with some of the ideas behind design, but what we do at Undercurrent doesn't have much to do with design. It's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of strategy and thinking about kind of what's happening in this, in this digital and social space. And so as I was thinking about how to, how to kind of approach this topic, um, I began to think about, uh, about showering and, uh, and, and patterns and habits, and, and that led me back uh, to childhood. And this is something that my mother said a couple times as I was a young man. Aaron, please use things as they were intended to be used. Uh, and that's circa 1986, 1987, 1988, uh, and so on. And the reason is that I had a habit of taking things and, and creating other purposes for them. So I would take, and this is one example, this is one of my, my many MacGyver moments. I realized that I desperately, well, I realized I wanted to be Batman. So I went to, I went to first grade for about four or five months dressed as Batman. And then I realized that Batman has a grappling hook. Uh, and not just any grappling hook, but kind of a serious piece of technology. And so I tried to combine CO2 cartridges for a completely different purpose with fishing hooks and uh, some, other, some other gear and ended up, uh, and ended up a little bit injured. Um, but that's, uh, that's sort of a... It's, it's a bit of a habit. They're really hard to get out. It's, it's a bit of a habit uh, that I had, which is just taking something and doing something else with it. And I, I never felt guilty because I feel like as human beings, we're, we're exceptional at this. Um, you know, if you look on the left there, you've got your uh, stone implements, which, you know, m earlier man saw kind of as this. Uh, and there's really not a lot, of, a lot of intent with these objects, so just things that they found and then kind of found a purpose for, uh, which, is, which is really, really fascinating stuff. And, and in a way, at least from where I'm coming from, Design presupposes intent. It's to say, I'm designing this to accomplish X objective or to provide X facility for you. So in the case of you know, the mouse trap here, it's designed for a very specific purpose, uh, to kill the mouse. Um, in, the, you know, in the way a serious game is designed to help us learn how to have, you know, attack cancer better or do surgery or whatever the case may be. And as you look at most of the design sort of industry and people that think of themselves as designers, they typically start with, I have a problem that I need a solution to or I have a a thing that I want to make so that people can do X and they want to fill in the blank. And that is a, a very interesting concept for me because in the space that, that we operate in, it doesn't seem to be a habit. Uh, and that got me thinking, you know, what happens when intent leaves room for interpretation? So you look at, uh, at this idea, and, and basically this is where the shampoo analogy comes in, ready? It's clever. Uh, on the back of the shampoo bottle, you know, it says suggested use. As if you would use shampoo for anything other than washing your hair or, you know, something else. And so it says, you know, rinse hair thoroughly, lather, rinse, and repeat. And everybody always gives them a lot of shit for the repeat part because it doesn't make any sense at all. But they don't change it. Uh, but this idea of suggested use is, is what I really want to talk about, which is to say, you know, when you have something that's given to you with specific purpose, like here's a hammer, it's good for hitting nails, and it's good for extracting nails, and that's about it, unless you, you know, have fairly violent tendencies. Uh, that's sort of one camp of things, but then there's another camp of things, which are things that have kind of a suggested purpose that you have to explore and figure out as you go, whether that's alone or in a group. What's interesting about that to me is that in my world, the suggested use is kind of a standard design principle. When you think about what's happening on the fringes of the social space, the mobile space, the digital space, where people are kind of building the next Facebook and building the next uh, you know, social environments and even games, the idea of telling you exactly what it's for, of exactly how to use it, is, has kind of gone out the window. And it's been replaced with something a lot more iterative and a lot more collaborative. And that, uh, that is a concept that, that has a lot of power in it. Uh, so I wanted to take a look at kind of some examples from, from my world and, and how they either are coming to be, and you might see them cropping up on the cover of a magazine next year, or some of the ones that have already come to be and that you've probably heard of, what was going on at the, at the outset from a design perspective, and, and how the, the sort of unforeseen impacted the overall success and the overall sort of shape and, and tenor of what it became. So first example, uh, everybody's probably heard of Twitter at least, given how insanely popular it's been lately from Oprah to Ashton to you know, God knows what with the VMAs. How many people are aware of Twitter? Yeah, lots of hands. How many people use Twitter? Not so many hands. Kind of strong on the right side of the room. What's the deal there? Um, <laughs> so, you know, for those of you that don't use it, you're certainly aware of what it is and what it represents. And, uh, and what it represents is kind of a communications platform that has radically changed the way we look at, you know, short-form communication, the way we look at 
how people can spread messages from you know, everything from news to you know, images to, to music to just day-to-day -day info flow. So that's still the core, the core concept. But it's not what makes Twitter you know, interesting and special. What makes Twitter interesting and special is all the things that happened on top of that core concept. So they brought that out there. They were like, hey, say what you're doing. And then the next thing that happened is people realized, well, I'm friends with you, and I want to tell you something. I want you to notice when I say this thing, because I'm saying it to you. I'm saying, I'm at the Cusp Conference, and you're there too. So how do I do that? Well, there's no way to do that. The, the system was not built to accommodate that. And so what the users did is they figured out, all right, what we'll do is we'll use the at symbol to communicate that aspect. So at Aaron Dignan, what the heck is up? I'm in Chicago too, let's go grab lunch. Or you broke my heart, you know, don't call me. Um, and then, so that was great. So then people started, they were riffing, they were replying to each other. That, you know, that became the idea of a reply, of talking to each other. And then it was the idea of, well, wait a second. What if I want to say something to you and I don't want all the people following me to hear it? What if I want to say something like, are you free tonight? Then the, the same thing, system wouldn't accommodate it, so people started naturally, just a few people started taking D and putting it in front of the name. So direct, direct message, one-to-one -one private communication. And so that started to spread throughout the system. And what literally happened is these things were being done by people and systems were being built that could sort of parse that code of using the ad or the D, and then the Twitter guys rushed to accommodate that. So they were sort of like moving the system along as this, as this unfolded. Basically, that sort of all emergent behavior happened, and then a whole other layer of things happened. A whole other layer of designers started to build things on top of it. So there's sort of a foundation created, and I think that's one of the ideas that we're talking about here is just you know, the suggested use model is the model of creating a platform or a foundation and then seeing what grows on top of it. So rather than building the whole building, build a good basement. The next example is called Foursquare. If last year was sort of the year of you know, Twitter and, and social, I think next year is the year of location-based stuff. Where am I and how does that matter? How can you take where I am and what I'm doing and give me a better sort of experience as a result? So here's the, my iPhone. Foursquare, ta-da, that's me. And you can see right here, one of my friends, Lauren, is right here. And I have last checked in and said that I'm at, uh, at the airport. And so the only thing I'm greeted with when I bring up this service is I'm greeted with the option to check in or to shout. So a shout would be the same thing as Twitter, me saying, here's me, here's what I'm doing. But the check-in is something different. So let's say I choose to check in. It presents me with choices. This thing knows, based on my GPS, where I am. So it knows that I'm within this vicinity, I'm within this square mile, and gives me an idea of what's nearby that I, that I possibly am at. And you know, it, let's say I'm in the mood for you know, some affordable yet lumberjacky attire. Uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll go with Eddie Bauer, uh, which, you know, which is a personal favorite of my father's, uh, which, we, which we attack him about all the time. Uh, so then I choose Eddie Bauer, and it gives me this, uh, this listing here. Now, I can check in here at Eddie Bauer. I can see other people that are here. I can tap to add a shout at the same time, and I can choose whether I tell my friends or not. So if I was at Eddie Bauer and I didn't want anyone to know, well, that would be an option. I could just you know, update my status for my own purposes and not let anyone know, or I can let everyone know that's a friend of mine. So I do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check in. And what you see here is it says, you know, We've got you at Eddie Bauer, so that's in the system, and it's my first time here, so I'm going to get a bonus of five points for checking in there. What are the points? The, basically what they've done is they've created a game-like environment where for every time that you check in somewhere new, you get points. And it becomes sort of this social contest. Who's going out the most? Who's going to the most bars? Who's going to the most places? Who's having the most fun? And basically, <laughs> there, is, there is a leaderboard. So... This is the Chicago leaderboard. Johnny S., if you're here, you're the man. Uh, and Jake and Lee and Ann and so on. I'm way at the bottom because I just got to Chicago and I have only been to Eddie Bauer, which I didn't even go to, and, uh, and here. So, um, but basically, it adds up those points from everything you've done, and there's a list of how many places you've checked into. And then you can look at just your friends or of the, of the city you're in. And this is the part that's unique about it. When you go to a new city, the service will ask you, hey, it looks like you're in Chicago and you're not from here. Do you want us to move you over to Chicago for the time that you're here? You say yes, and it starts you over. You have no points, you have no friends, 
and you have no badges. And we'll get to the badges in a second. So then you're starting over in a new city, so now you have to, you know, if your friends are there, like Lauren happens to be a friend from New York, so she's in my system when we're both here. But if, I, if she was back home, I'd have no friends whatsoever, which is devastating. <laughs> so, you know, that's the leaderboard. So that's one reason to use it. The, uh, the other reason to use it is that there's this idea of the mayor. So if you go to the Grand Lux Cafe on North Michigan Avenue, uh, a, a cheesecake factory company, I believe, um, they, they have a person who's gone more than anyone else. So Max J goes to the Grand Lux Cafe a lot, like a scary lot. And so as a result, he's the mayor, quote unquote. And for any place that's popular, there will be a mayor, and the mayorship can be taken away. So if I go to Grand Lux every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I can take the mayorship from him. And that's really interesting because what, what's happening is in, in towns literally all across America, bars in particular, are saying the mayor drinks free. And so they're creating this whole rush of people trying to become the mayor, and every night whoever's the mayor is coming in and they're drinking for free, and it's a madhouse. So they've actually kind of created a reason to come into the store and a reason, a reason to move through. So this idea of how do we motivate people to do different kinds of behaviors is kind of built into the system. And then the last reason that's, that's pretty, pretty interesting is this idea, or second to last actually, this idea of badges. So not only can I go to this bar or that bar or the museum or, whatever, or the airport, but I can also do a series of things that add up to something special. And then, and then the last thing, and this is where I think the, this whole concept gets extremely interesting, is these are tips. So these are people that are in a particular area, that know that area, that know that place, and they're leaving kind of a little tidbit, a little piece of graffiti, so to speak, in that area for you to find. And so it'll say things like, get the Sunday brunch dim sum special at Prime House David Burke, or there's great alfresco dining for a quick lunch at Coco Pazzo. I don't know if that's true, but that's, uh, but that's something that Chris left. And so people are leaving these tips all over the place, and they're starting to add up to you know, particular recommendations and things that you should know. So someone that doesn't know anything about San Francisco, but that is a hardcore Foursquare user, can go to San Francisco, can land, can bring up Foursquare, and have a pretty good idea of what places are most popular, what people are most popular, what things they should try, what things they shouldn't try, what, uh, what things they might want to explore based on badges that are available. There's a whole suite of sort of behavior incentivizing things just waiting for them in the application. Uh, and so that's, that's really cool stuff. Now again, the, the question that everyone asks when you tell them about Foursquare, and usually people are told a lot faster than what I just told you, they're told like, it's this thing where you check in and then you're there. Um, <laughs> Ask, ask your, you know, your children or your nieces and nephews, and that's pretty much what you'll get. Uh, but you know, when people are told that way, the, the question is always like, well, why would I do this? Why would I, why would I take the time to go do all this stuff? And, and what's interesting about it is that just like with Twitter, the answers are, are different. You know, for me, I really like the tips. For my brother, he really likes kicking his friends' asses at going out and getting wasted. For someone else, they really like collecting the badges because it gives them something to do on the weekend. So there's a lot of different reasons to kind of engage with it. And now you see this idea of bars reacting to the mayorship and brands starting to think about maybe they could put an offer in there to show you something new that you might want to see. There's all this sort of behavior starting to bubble up out of it. And when you talk to Dennis and Naveen, the guys that created it, uh, you know, the last thing they did was sell a company called uh, Dodgeball to Google. Uh, and then Google screwed that up, and so they started this instead. Um, but if you talk to them, they're like, you know, we don't really know what the roadmap is. And it's kind of interesting to hear them say it so bluntly, but they're like, we don't really know what the business model is, per se. Like, help us figure it out. We don't really know where the product's going. We know, we know what we like to do, and we know what's fun about it, and we know what gets us excited, but we're kind of putting it out there and seeing what people want to do with it. And now there's close to 100,000 people on it. It's really starting to bubble up and figure itself out. And, uh, and that's adding up to something you know, pretty remarkable. The main idea or question or sort of guide that I can give for, for creating environments that have this kind of impact and that sort of become a platform is to simply see if someone would logically ask another person, why do you use it? Because no one would ask that about a hammer, and no one would ask that about a video game, and no one would ask that about a television. But the kind of stuff that we're talking about, they would. And so as you sort of work on whatever project you might be working on, if you're thinking about trying to create some emergent behavior, you can, you can ask yourself, would people say, well, why do you use it? I use it this way, but do you use it that way? Because I, I use it this way. And if they can get people to kind of think about it that way, you'll, you'll be down the path towards this kind of stuff and, and possibly onto something uh, very, very interesting. So thank you.